Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here. We're live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake, also playing live in St. Paul over SPNN. We're glad to have you here, and if you have, it's a call-in show, talk show, so if you have comments or questions, call in there, 651-747-3838. Also, if you want to see some of the past shows, go to youtube.com backslash... Back I want to say splash, but backslash speechless MN. And then if you have any comments and you don't want to call uh, or suggestions for the show, or you, you know, uh, email me speechlessmn at gmail.com. So today's show, a lot of information, updates about what's going on down at the Capitol regarding uh, your rights, your liberties, election laws. Uh, bathroom bill for grade schoolers where the boys can go in the girls room and girls can go in the boys um, also child custody uh, ch child support uh, family law bills uh, that passed um, then uh, event I went to today the national prayer breakfast governor Day Dayton spoke and I just have some comments about what he had to say it was interesting um, parental rights. Again, tell a little bit of a story of a family in Missouri who had their son taken from them while they were in Illinois by the Illinois government. Uh, interesting to say the least, the twist that went on there. And it, revolve, it involves a hospital uh, versus a parent and the medical care that the hospital gives versus what the parents think they should give. But it's not as complicated as you think. Uh, also, uh, we're going to show the whole clip of the uh, Michelle McDonald press conference over her federal lawsuits against uh, four Dakota County sheriffs and uh, a prosecutor uh, from working on behalf of Dakota County. I'll show that whole lawsuit and then uh, we'll get had an interesting discussion about uh, Sandra Guzzini Ruckies, a case that I've showed on this program and talked about in Sandra Guzzini Ruckies, been on the show about her two missing children that are on the national exploited, uh, missing and exploited children's list and everybody's wondering where they are and all of a sudden now there's all this attention being drawn around where are they when she's been screaming about it you know o over a year ago about a year ago saying where are my kids and nobody cared and now that somebody's paid attention they're coming back after her, well why didn't you say something why didn't you do something and the reality is she has so we're going to talk about that you know what what's really going on here and uh it's a mystery in my mind i don't i have some ideas but ideas are meaningless because you can be wrong about your ideas you need to uh, explore all things and so the police may have ideas and they have said they have ideas but they could be totally wrong and they're being told they're wrong but until you have hard information what do you do all right, so uh, first thing, tomorrow down at the legislature, there's going to be a hearing starting around 10 on the House floor regarding election laws. The Senate has passed a bill that allows felons who are out of jail but still doing probation or parole, it allows them to vote. And that bill is going to be heard in the House tomorrow. Word is it's going to be a long, long, long discussion. There's a lot of things in the bill. Um, and so it's not going to line up is the bottom line. The House is not going to allow felons to vote until they're done serving their time. Uh, which is interesting. If you're a felon and you... Um, you get your gun rights taken away, you know, and you don't, and, but you can get your guns back, but you have to then be what they call totally off book. You have to be off parole. You have to be off, uh, um, 
I forgot the other term. I just used it. I just forgot it. Uh, so you, you have to be, you have to add surgery time. Everything's completed for what you're charged with, and then you can have your gun rights back. Uh, so the, these are rights, and this is going to be an interesting debate because it's really about, in my mind, who's going to, um, who's going to benefit from felons being able to vote right away uh, after their prison sentence, but not after parole. Um, it's going to, in my mind, it's going to uh, benefit the Democrats. There's some 47,000 felons that are on parole and probation uh, right now. And if they vote, we hardly see a Republican win office again. But, but that's not the real issue. The real issue is they haven't served their time, they haven't finished their time and their punishment for what they have done. And so the language out there is these felons are victims now. No, they're not the victim in this situation. It's the people that they victimize that are the victims. Okay, and the felons are not the victims. Therefore, finish your sentence. And somehow we're being compassionate and that, you know, there's a, there's a study out there saying, hey, uh, from Florida, that people that wanted, people that were still in jail had, when they got voting, not in jail, but out of jail, but still on probation, got voting rights, uh, they were less likely to uh, reoffend, and in that, but you got to understand the study. What those felons had to do in order to get voting rights is they had to go through a series of process that was significant in order to vote. And very few people went through that process. So you can have a study that says, yeah, all the felons that got their voting rights back, uh, very few of them reoffended. And it, it lowered it. Well, okay, but if you only have out of, you know, like 47,000, you only have 200 that want to vote and go through the process, yeah, it is likely that they won't vote. But there's a, they, they won't reoffend. But it's a, flawed, it's a flawed survey. It's not the same example, and it's not the same bill that's being passed. They're just saying, you're out of jail, you show up, you get to vote. But they're also not addressing the issue that it is against our Constitution in Minnesota for felons to vote. They cannot vote. And currently our system says felons, or currently our system says you go vote, okay? If afterwards we find out you're a felon, guess what? Your vote still counts. That's how it is. It's just unbelievable. If you're dead, your vote still counts, <laughs> you know? Uh, somebody can sign your name. You can't do anything about it. You don't get to vote, and they voted for you. So th there's just this weird system we got going in Minnesota that says felons can't vote. Those who are um, mentally challenged have uh, been ruled by a court that are incompetent to vote, uh, can't vote. But if they go and do it, it counts. Just un unbelievable. So that's going to be a big debate. I think it's going to be worth wa watching. I think you're going to learn a lot about the election system in Minnesota and what's taking place. All right. Um, another bill that is not being considered right now uh, is this group. There's a group of people that have been going and saying, hey, uh, let us well, St. Paul schools and, and uh, at least one other school district went and said, okay, if you're a boy and you think you're a girl, you get to use the girl's bathroom. If you're a girl, you think you're a boy, you get to use the boy's bathroom. And which is just outrageous. There's, there's no law that allows this to happen. And there's been trying, a group of people have been trying to put a bill in and get it passed that there would not 
this cannot happen, that boys can't go into girls. And it's based on what the child chooses and what the child says, that's what I am. You know, five-year-olds, six-year-olds. And it's, it's outrageous on its face, but there's been people trying to get a bill passed to prevent this from happening, and it hasn't been heard. It hasn't been heard in any committee. It's been blocked on the Senate side, and the House side is considering it, but they haven't had it through any committees, and they may put it through as an amendment into a bill uh, that comes onto the, onto the floor, but still there's nothing being said. And it's just, it's just outrageous. It may be a bargaining chip or whatever in order to get things done. Who knows? But it, it's probably one of the saddest things of this legislature, that the legislature is going to permit this child abuse going on, and in my opinion, is setting up children for sexual exploitation, and, and especially the kids that uh, don't share that lifestyle, uh, don't have the beliefs. Um, it's sexploitation of these children. It's child abuse, sexual child abuse in my behavior, and it's setting up kids to end up being trafficked uh, in the future. So pretty, pretty big uh, statements there, but that's, that's my belief. Uh, of what's going on so I, I there's just no way I would send any child to St. Paul Public Schools if you got your child in the St. Paul Public Schools get them to another school district just get them out of there um, preferably a private or homeschooling uh, where you don't have to have your child dealing with this the St. Paul Public Schools are no longer dealing with educating your children and maximizing the learning ability of your children. It's all about every child is at the same level, and if you excel, we got to bring you down. If you're down below, we got to, you know, we're going to bring you up. We're all at the same level. But you know what? They're not going to bring people up, but they're going to bring people down. This 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 whole thing, Common Core. Just the word Common, you know, is should tell you something's wrong. You don't want Common. Okay, you you want uh, your children to excel. You want a teacher to be able to teach to maximize your child's gifts and abilities, and they can't do that if they treat every child as having the same abilities. Okay, they have the same rights. They may not have the same abilities, and a teacher is going to need a good teacher is going to adjust their teaching style to the child. Uh, and so that the child can learn. Uh, but with Common Core, doesn't work that way. Just doesn't, it's, it's one size fits all, all across the nation. And it's terrible. Okay, um, now a bill did pass. Last Friday, the uh, child custody changes took place. Uh, in a, this is something that's been worked on for, for a long time. I've covered it in the past. Um, dealing with uh, uh, some hearings down in the House anyway. We didn't show anything in the Senate, but basically there's uh, two groups of people, 10 people for um, the state having more control, 10 people for parental, parent, parental rights having control. And Governor Dayton, well, there was a bill that was passed overwhelmingly uh, two years ago and Dayton vetoed it that allowed a, a one number change changing the presumption of uh, uh, parenting time from 25 percent to 35 percent and Governor Dayton pocket vetoed that bill and said you know the two groups you know get together and whatever you two uh, whatever your groups 100 percent agree on um, Will, will pass. You know, I'll sign it into law. Well, they got together, did their work, and came up with a, uh, an omnibus uh, family law bill. Uh, and through the work of Peggy Scott, John Lash, uh, Senator Newman uh, in the Senate, a lot of senators. But anyway, this bill passed last Thursday 121 to 0 in the House. That means there was uh, a few people missing, 
in the vote. And in the Senate, it passed, uh, I think it was uh, 61 to 3. So a couple other votes missing. But it's interesting, the three that didn't vote for it, one Democrat, and I forgot the name, but two Republicans, Senator Ortman, who is now leaving. Uh, I'm really surprised at that, that she didn't vote for this bill. And then also um, Brandon Peterson uh, didn't vote for it, which I'm also surprised uh, that that took place. So perfect bill, no, but actually stuff that has been trying to get done for 20 years to make the system more fair. There's a lot better language. There's some language that isn't worse, but it's, ah, okay, you know, let, we'll let that one go. Uh, but it came in there, and uh, I think we'll have a much better family law system, at least until uh, we get better language that will presume that parents are fit parents, will presume that parents have rights to their kids, and that that time should be maximized between the two parents as much as possible. Until that happens, uh, we won't have the, uh, the best system uh, right now. So it's a good step, and uh, I'd like to show some video of that, but I don't have any. It was a busy week. Okay, um, was at the governor's prayer, well, it used to be called the governor's prayer breakfast. That's when uh, Al Qui then changed it to um, we should be praying for the people of the state of Minnesota rather than the governor. It's, at least that was the story that was told at the prayer breakfast. Um, but governor... Our, our governor there, Governor Dayton, and he spoke, and, you know, it was a good speech. I mean, it was uh, entertaining and, and um, nice to hear a little bit of his history and stuff and, and a little bit of his faith walk. I, I question that based on his behavior. Um, but a couple things he said that really kind of drew my attention, and... And it's more of, why did he say this? And why did he say it this way? And why did he say it to these people? And, you know, I've seen it happen over and over again. And I actually see these people that coming together for prayer or the Christian community um, say the same thing, and yet they, they have it wrong. You know, there's part of a problem with a politician giving out scripture. The scripture is usually uh, culturized, or whoever's around them that is telling them this is what the scripture means, most likely has been through a, a, a has been, I don't want to say deculturized, but has been interpreted by the culture that they're around. And so when Dayton said, you know, Render to Caesar's what is Caesar's. He said it in the context of, you know, the people need to provide for the state. Um, the state is not is Caesar in a sense, uh, and and give to God what is God's. And so when he when Dayton was saying Jesus used this parable as a reference to the separation, you know, they were trying to trick the disciple. The Pharisees, the religious rulers, were trying to trick Jesus and trap him. They were trying to get him to say everything's God's or everything's Caesar's and therefore get the crowd divided about Jesus, about what side he was on. And the brilliance of Jesus' answer is that most people don't get what he was saying today. Most pastors, and it's not taught correctly, because you have to put Jesus' answers in the context of the rest of Scripture. So Jesus said, give to uh, Caesar's, well, he said, look at the coin. Whose picture's on there? And then they said, Caesar's. Well, then he said, give to Caesar's what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. And Dayton said, there's the distinction. There is to be a state, and there is, 
and the state has its things. And <laughs> that's my interpretation of what he's saying. And there's God, and God has his things. You know, so make sure you as Christians are living in both those worlds. However, in the context of the rest of Scripture, Jesus made a clear statement that trapped the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees know that the proper teaching is everything is God's. Everything is God's. The state is God. He raises up and he lowers uh, who's going to be leaders of particular uh, people groups and of particular nations. He does that. God has ownership over all things. And so when Jesus answered that, the Pharisees saw it as a rebuke to them even asking the question that they couldn't answer it themselves, that God is owner of all things. And, you know, and, and that's the bottom line. And so the crowds, oh, okay. You know, it's kind of when Jesus spoke in parables, that it, it was there to blind people who couldn't get the picture or who God was not going to allow to get the picture. And this is the same type of thing. He could have answered, yeah, you know, he did answer, give to Caesars what is Caesars. Okay, what is Caesars? Nothing. And, of course, what Caesar says is Caesar, Caesar says is his, but... He has no authority to say that because God owns all things. That's what was really going on there. So that, that was a little, okay, why is he doing this? And why is he misinterpreting this scripture? And then he starts talking about the, the separation of church and state. And that we have, uh, <clears throat> although not in our declaration and not in our constitution, it was... Um, known and implied that there's going to be the separation of church and state. <clears throat> and, and later, Thomas Jefferson wrote a letter explaining it further, what that meant. Well, here, here's the thing. The, what the separation of church and state means is this. Okay? The state cannot go and elect and tell the church who it's going to be its pastor's and what the church doctrine is going to be. And the, and the church cannot go to the state and say, okay, our church says this is who the governor is going to be and this is who the representatives are going to be. The church can't do that. It's, a, in other words, taking authority over it in, in who's going to be, the re, in our case, the representative or who's going to be the king. Because that used to be, happen. The king used to name the pope. The pope used to name the king at various times in history. And so now we wrote a document that says, no, <clears throat> the church and the people of that state can vote for whoever they want. And if there's more people that belong to the church and they're in a majority, you know what? That group can elect the governor. But what Governor Dayton was trying to say is, no, that's not how it works. And, 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 and we're, we, we'd, if that worked that way, we'd have a religious theocracy. And no, no, if it worked that way, no, we wouldn't have a religious theocracy because it would still be a vote of the people. Okay, And that's the distinction that most people don't get. And so... And I was wondering why I was throwing out a religious theocracy when it's the people that vote the people in. So he was putting us all this and saying all this way. Well, here's the message. This is what Obama has been doing at the prayer breakfasts and telling the Christians, forget about abortion, you should do other things. What, they're try what he was doing is sending out false information to make people believe that they really shouldn't engage because they're religious, have these biblical values, therefore they should stay out of the state's business. That's what he was trying to say, and he was doing it by twisting not only what our Constitution says, but what Scripture says. So, that's my... Otherwise, the prayer breakfast was great. It was a fantastic time. Robert Dahl, who's a senior portfolio portfolio manager, chief equity stat, uh, strategist at Nuveen Asset Management uh, spoke, and it was, it was very good, some very motivational 
um, and good thoughts for life. Uh, but what Dayton's doing is also is, is an example of uh, the progressive, the liberal, they're not progressive, the regressive appropriation of language to make it, seem, to make it mean something else completely different and to fit their agenda and to push you down and not have you engage. People engage. It's your responsibility. The Bible says engage. There's not one place in the Bible where it doesn't tell you to engage in the culture and the people around you. It's just the opposite. Yet we buy, you know, the Christian community buys the lies and of their pastors because you know what the real the pastors don't know how it works. They they don't know the system. They don't know how to figure it out. All right. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, we're going through this pretty quick here, and uh, we're running out of time because we'll go to the next thing here. Uh, oh, before that, also at the prayer breakfast, uh, there was a father's group meeting, and it was really good. And we're going to have these guys on the show because it's just fantastic uh, what they had to say and fantastic testimony of how God changes people's lives. And so this Tom Blee is a medical doctor, uh, trauma and acute care surgeon at Regents Hospital, uh, was there and, and talked about the violence that goes on in St. Paul. And it says the news doesn't even cover one-tenth of what's really happening. And in the summer, it's really bad, where they're, gonna, they're getting seven to 10 uh, shootings uh, every night in St. Paul um, and people getting hurt or, or stabbed or whatever and it's uh, quite a race there and he, he was just thinking what do we do and he ran into this guy John Turnipseed 10 time uh, felon uh, obviously can't vote I think he's off parole now I don't know uh, may not be um, out of his 30 family members, 10 are serving life sentences for m murder. And his story of how God came and changed his life. And there's a lot more fathers and men there who talked about their lives being transformed through Jesus Christ, uh, the police chief of St. Cloud. Um, but we're going to have them on and tell their story and what's going on in St. Paul. Uh, you're going to want to see that sometime uh, when that comes up. Uh, and also Urban Ventures Group uh, is also fa fascinating. Neat, neat men, neat uh, people trying to change the lives of the youth and fathers in our community. Uh, so uh, we'll see that when it happens. Okay. Um, the McDonald Press Conference. Michelle McDonald's federal lawsuit uh, against four Ramsey County or Dakota County sheriffs and Dan Flugel, the Flugel law firm that is the prosecutor uh, in that city. And we're going to hear, uh, we're going to show this press conference now. It takes about 15 minutes and then uh, we'll come back. All right. Come back with me to September 11th, not the September 11th that we all know and mourn about, but September 11th, 2013 in Dakota County, Minnesota. Good afternoon. My name is Mpatanishi Tayari Garrett. I go by M. Tayari Garrett. I'm an attorney, one of the attorneys, representing Michelle McDonald and Tom Shimoda. I also have here attorney Nathan Bush who will also give um, uh, some statements a little bit later in, in this press conference as well as two of our supporters. On September 11th, 2013 in Dakota County, Minnesota, there's an event that we don't all know about involving Michelle McDonald. And that event caused Michelle McDonald to file this monumental lawsuit. And we call it monumental because we hope that Michelle's case and my case and Ferguson and New York are just isolated incidents that we can stamp out by shining a light on the injustices that occur in some of our courts here in our country. 
Michelle McDonald, two weeks ago, filed a lawsuit against Dakota County officials, including Bob Wegner, Christopher Melton, Timothy Gonder, John Knapper, who are all deputy sheriffs in Dakota County. She also sued Dan Flugel, Flugel Law Firm, Dakota County itself, and John Doe's. Tom Shimoda joined in the lawsuit because he too was affected by what Michelle <clears throat> McDonald went through. And what did she go through? Well, let's go back to September 11, 2013. On that day, Ms. McDonald filed a federal action against and sought to remove Dakota County Judge for what she deemed and what she thought were inappropriate and unlawful activities that the judge um, did to her client, her family law client at the time. The very next day on September 12th, Ms. McDonald would summon to that judge's courtroom where deputy sheriffs of Dakota County handcuffed her, detained her, and over the course of that evening and the next day, tortured her in their jail facilities for several hours. Ms. McDonald was not allowed a single phone call. And even though they much later charged her with a criminal contempt of court charge, that charge was dismissed by an independent judge as lacking what in legal terms is called probable cause. And what does that mean? It means that they unlawfully gathered evidence and information in order to charge her with the crime. That was ultimately dismissed. As a result of that, Ms. McDonald filed this lawsuit and Mr. Tom Shimoda filed this lawsuit, which is detailed um, in our claim, 60 pages of detail of what Ms. McDonald went through over the course of two days. I'm going to turn it over to Nathan, who is going to talk a little bit more about uh, why we took the case. Thank you, Auntie Yim. <laughs> You're welcome. My name is Nathan Bush. I'm the lead attorney in this case. Um, I was introduced to Ms. McDonald by a one Connie Neal, who's a, um, an activist down in southwest Minnesota. And Connie Neal uh, approached me while I was running for judge in southwest Minnesota uh, and was a big supporter of mine. When Connie first told me about Michelle McDonald, when, when she got done with the story, I looked at her and I said, what planet is this woman from? That has to be a lie. And Connie, over the next few months, kept insisting that I needed to talk to Michelle McDonald to hear her story firsthand. And so it was but a few months ago that I actually sat down with Michelle McDonald and listened to her for the better part of an afternoon. Of course, I have good filters in my ears, so much of what she said I filtered out. But there were some real genuine nuggets on the inside of the story that Mich Michelle McDonald told me. And when she was done, I said, I always thought that in America, in the United States, things like that can't happen. You cannot be, as an attorney, handcuffed in a courtroom forcibly removed by deputy sheriffs, detained in the prisoner's cell outside the, court, outside the courtroom, taken to jail for 36 hours, and be subjected to seven of the 11 internationally recognized forms of torture. For what? Well, they made up some cockamamie story about she took a photograph on the inside of a courtroom. That's not a crime. Then they made up some story about contempt of court that had no basis, as Auntie M says, no probable cause. Our Constitution says that we have rights. We have the right to be heard. We have the right of free speech. We have the right to know the charges against us. We have the right to be free from illegal detention. Michelle McDonald had her rights taken away. Now we're all hoping that this is an isolated case here in Dakota County in Minnesota. I have my views on that. But Tom and Michelle have asked me to express their position 
that this is a, an, aberra an aberration that needs to be corrected so that we can all move on. And that's why Auntie M and I are here. Michelle was detained and prosecuted and persecuted because she stood up for the constitutional rights of her client, who was just an average, ordinary, single mother of five children, that the judge took her house away, took her children away. And Michelle said, no, that's not right. The next thing we know, Michelle was handcuffed, had to present the rest of the case in handcuffs, shackled to a wheelchair, and then tortured. In America. I could see that happening in some other third world country, but not in America. Auntie N M and I are putting our careers, our licenses on the line to say to this court and to say to those deputy sheriffs, you were wrong. You were wrong. And we're going to prove it. Thank you. Officers, obviously, prosecutors, judges have some form of immunity. Uh, is that going to be claimed in this, that the officers were acting uh, as the law allows them to act? They get to arrest people, they get to incarcerate them, you know. Um, what, what do you think their defense is going to be in this issue? Well, if I understand your question correctly, you were asking about what is the proper behavior of a judge, what's the proper behavior of the officers, um, and you also brought up the whole issue of immunity. Um, it's believed in the United States that judge, a sitting judge, if he's acting within his judicial capacity, has what is known as absolute immunity. I believe that Section 1983 of 42 U.S. Code, you know, yeah, United States Code does not go to that extent, but that's an issue uh, to be fought out later. We are not implicating the judge in this case um, because we want to focus on the perpetrators who were the deputy sheriffs, the Flugel Law Firm, and the County of Dakota, Minnesota. Now you asked about the sheriffs themselves. There's two aspects of that. One of which is the sheriff is independently elected from the judge. The sheriff doesn't have to do what the judge tells him to do. If the sheriff views the order of a judge to be illegal, the judge can flat out refuse to, to follow that order because it's illegal. And the judge has absolute immunity, or the sheriff has immunity for that because he's acting within the color of his office. Now, what happened here was, was different. In all of my years in the law, I have never seen a sheriff come in, shackle a, an attorney, and then haul them off later to jail and subjected them to seven of, the inter, seven of the 11 internationally recognized forms of torture. He was not acting within his color of his office, and he is liable under the, under the federal uh, code. Yeah, um, I, I completely agree. Um, sheriffs or police have what's called qualified immunity, and that's a lower standard than the absolute immunity that judges have. And so we're able to more easily sue sheriffs or police officers when they do things that are outside of uh, their training um, or when they're not trained properly. Um, we can sue the county for lack of training. And um, so when you hear about cases, you know, I mentioned Ferguson earlier, when the police shoot someone or beat someone up in Dakota County, you know, one of the defendants here um, actually was sued just a few years ago for beating a woman up, uh, punching her in the face and breaking her leg. Dakota County paid $350,000 for that. He wasn't disciplined. Um, he wasn't put off, taken off duty. Nothing happened to him. They said he did nothing wrong. They just paid the money because they didn't want to go through a lawsuit. 
So uh, in that case, similar to this case, um, one of the things that we're arguing is that qualified immunity does not apply because obviously you're not trained to inflict seven forms of torture on someone or unlawfully arrest someone within your job. So what are these uh, seven forms of torture that you're alleging? Do you have the list there? I do have the list. Um, they include sexual humiliation. They include isolation. They include um, uh, temperature extremes. They include uh, noise, um, sensory bombardment or noise. Um, they include psychological techniques. They include psycho uh, solitary confinement or isolation. I don't know if I said that already. Um, and sensory deprivation. Um, and with respect to, for example, one of the temperature extremes, I mean, they did things that j they just didn't have to do, but they, they did just to kind of get uh, abuse her, uh, quite frankly, for lack of a, a, a different word other than torture. Um, in one example, um, they put Miss McDonald in a, um, a cell, a solitary cell, and there was a mattress in that cell as well as a blanket. Well, for no reason whatsoever, one of the defendants just came in took the mattress out and took the blanket out. They reduced the, the temperature in that cell to where um, she felt like it was near freezing and she was using her stockings to keep warm. And she was using toilet paper to keep warm. Well, they came in and took her toilet paper. Um, and some of the sexual humiliation, there, um, she was put in a all men's jail cell and there was a, a uh, a place where uh, the male deputies could look into her um, solitary room and peep in on her if she had to use the bathroom, which of course she would have to um, over a two-day um, confinement. Um, so there were just a number of just things like that that they did um, that, you know, yeah, we know that we do that to, to people that are prisoners of war, but our own citizens. Does Dakota County have a woman's do they have a women's jail? I, um, I just learned that the women's jail is, that they use is actually in Ramsey County. Mm -hmm. So when they have to put women in, in jail, they don't take them to the male jail, they take them to Ramsey County. Have you heard of other incidents? I mean, you, you mentioned the one incident of the, the sheriff who broke a leg hit a face, but have you heard of other type of incidents? Is this a pattern going on in Dakota County with the sheriff's department? Or At, at this point in time, we really don't know that. Um, and as to it being a pattern, um, that's not really central to our case. We are merely focusing on what's happened to Michelle. Um, if it turns out to be a pattern in Dakota County, I think, and we discover that, that will certainly be brought out to the public through the case. Um, and hopefully somebody will stand up somewhere along the line and say enough is enough. Has, has there been a court date set on this yet? Um, all of the defendants have now been served, and the first response or the first answer is due next week, the end of next we week. We are um, expecting, well, at least I am, uh, that they're going to try to bring a motion to dismiss. Um, I think they're going to lose it, if they try that. And, and so this, where's this, uh, it's going into federal court? This has uh, been filed in federal court in St. Paul, right? Minneapolis. 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 We're out of the state court system. Okay. Do, you, do we know what judge is going to hear it? Judge Thunheim. Okay. Yes. The judge has already been assigned. The case number is 15CV01590 if anyone wants to look it up. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, interesting press conference to say the least um, they are not going after the judge right now but they did uh, Michelle I should say not these attorneys uh, filed a civil rights claim against Judge Knutson in uh, federal court that uh, was dismissed and then that was appealed to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, and there was a one paragraph basically saying judges have absolute immunity, uh, you know, acting in their official capacity, but 
they can't do things outside of their official capacity. So in this case, Judge Knutson, uh, and the testimony was given, filed, and of course he was not allowed to be deposed at all, but from the sheriffs who are now in this lawsuit, according to their testimony, uh, which I heard in the courtroom, said this Judge David Knutson gave an oral warrant to uh, arrest Michelle and get the camera. And the thing about that is oral warrants are illegal. Okay, you can't do them. It's got to be written down and the property to be seized and the persons to be seized has to be written down on a paper. And that did not happen. And so therefore a judge is acting outside his official capacity uh, in his job. But the courts don't want this known. And the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, now at the, at the district court, there's some 40 people in the courtroom at the district court level. And uh, covered outside, of course you can't see and hear what's going on inside the court. It's amazing. You know, they, they just don't understand this freedom of the press issue in our courts. Uh, a lot of people there, Eighth Circuit, all of a sudden goes, oh, well, we're not having oral arguments. And they issue uh, a one, one, maybe two paragraph uh, answer saying judges have immunity. Not explaining anything, just judges have immunity. <laughs> you know, no didn't lay out any facts of the case or anything like that. Well, that's being appealed to the total Eighth Circus Cor Circuit Court of Appeals. If they hear it or to decide not to hear it, then they'd go to the Supreme Court. Uh, so, I interesting uh, facts there. Uh, they're not going after the judge in this civil rights lawsuit. This is a, thi a different thing. And so my take on it is they're going, they're with depositions and of course there's already been court testimony and state court regarding this issues on the probable cause hearings uh, the, what these deputies do there's depositions they're going to ask the deputies all kinds of questions about who said what and who did what to establish a record there so that maybe down the road they can go back after after the judge uh, under different circumstances or at least set a record as to what Judge David Knudsen was doing to Michelle McDonald. Um, I also thought a very interesting thing here is they put her in a women's, they did not, they, Dakota County doesn't have a women's jail, okay, uh, but they use Ramsey County's jail and Michelle was in there at 2.30 in the afternoon and 36 hours they didn't get her over to Ramsey County. It was just it was just bizarre to me. Uh, I mean, that's that's a big issue there. And if you've been in those cells, if you've seen how they work, there there is not this privacy. Uh, you don't have it, and it, it should be. Now, even even in a workhouse situation, uh, and they have women's guards, you as a man still have your privacy uh, there. I, and I don't get why they have women's guards in the men's jail anyway. Just shouldn't, just doesn't need to happen. Shouldn't happen. Uh, I even heard a couple guards talking and saying a woman talking to a male guard saying, "Hey, uh, this could be a problem here. But it's one of these days we're just going to have all women here, you know, because if you go half and half, it could all, you know, half men, half women. The schedules could fit." So that you know, you end up being 80, 90 percent women versus the versus the men, and that's a situation that's not going to work. And if you've seen the guards in Ramsey County, <laughs> some pretty big guys, uh, nice guys, but very big guys. Um, you wouldn't want to mess with them at all. So you know, sexual uh, taunting, sexual uh, or isolation. Uh, temperature extremes, sensory bombardment, and sensory dep um, uh, deprivation, uh, you know, at the same time. Just because you have one doesn't mean you can't use the other. Uh, so pretty, pretty serious stuff, but it's, because of this lawsuit, it's led into questions about whether 
um, because part of this was happening is Michelle was defending pro bono uh, Sandra Grazzini Rocky. This was Sandra Grazzini's Rocky court case where the two children are now on the missing and exploited children's list. She was representing uh, Sandra pro bono and that means you don't, she doesn't get paid for it. All the money had been spent uh, through prior attorneys taking tons of money and doing nothing for her. And, um, and so during this process, Michelle gets arrested. And, and so now the press, just in the last two months, have finally picked up on this case of uh, the Sandra Grazzini Rucky and the children being missing. But that's been going on for, w w you know, about a year and a half now. And so the press is wondering, well, why hasn't Sandra Grazzini Rucky, ha why hasn't Michelle McDonald been out there saying, where are these kids? And, and the reality is they had been out there. They'd been to the Lakeville police. They'd been to the judge. The judge canceled a hearing to find out it's, so that people can go on record before the judge as to where the children are and what they knew about where the children is. And that hearing was called by Sandra Grazzini Rocky. And the judge, David Knudsen, canceled it. So if people were concerned about where the kids are, why, why did that happen? I mean, if all these other people that are supposed to be concerned, the judges, the Lakeville police, you know, why haven't they been doing anything? And, and part of the mindset is here in this situation is that you get into this, oh, it's a divorce case. So somebody knows where the kids are. Somebody has custody. Somebody's doing something. And you get into that mindset. And I had gotten to that mindset when she said, I haven't seen my kids for X amount of time. You're just thinking, okay, the court really treated her poorly, and said, no time with your kids. Okay, that's what you think. But what was really being said was, my two daughters are missing, and I don't know where they're at. Now, it took me a while to get that, uh, but that type is, is the type of language that needs to be used but wasn't quite being used. And so you have to interpret these things and try to figure out what's being said. But finally, it was told to me, I don't know where my daughters are. They're missing. Look, look here, missing children on the exploited children's list. And um, the, the trauma of that is, is very significant. And you do everything you do as, can do as a parent. You, you, you've been to Channel 9 News. You've, you've uh, been to the Lakeville Police. You try to go before the judge, but the judge is too busy violating constitutional rights and beating up on Sandra Grazzini Rucky that he's not going to hear it. And so now this gets into the news that the kids are gone, and then, you know, you're a year down the road. Michelle McDonald runs for the Minnesota Supreme Court, partly drawing attention to the issue. There's a problem with our courts. Uh, in their behavior, and and then you get uh, what else took place? Uh, she's filed, Michelle McDonald's filing the federal lawsuits against the sheriffs and against the judge. Well, what about the kids? Well, you know what? People weren't paying attention to the kids, so she's doing these other things to therefore draw attention to the kids, and it finally hit. But at first, it's backfiring in the sense of the press is saying, why are you doing all these things, and why haven't you been concerned about the kids? It's because you wouldn't listen about the kids. That's why. And now people are listening, and the questions are being asked. But they're treating it as a divorce case or a, um, you know, there's an underground. Just like there was the underground for the uh, slavery uh, and people would be underground railroad. There's an underground railroad in uh, divorce cases when parents, rightly or wrongly, think their children are being abused. There's a system out there, and I don't know who it is or what they do or who they are, that will take the kids and get them to what they think is safety until those kids can actually have a voice and do or say something about it. But what they also, the press also isn't saying is that David Grazzini Rucky left a phone message 
to the family members and said, you go through with this divorce or whatever, here's what's coming, and six gunshots go off, one for each of the five kids and then their mother. And uh, I've heard that, uh, I think we've even played it on the show, I just don't remember that, uh, that recording. So, um, you know, what do you, what do you do as a child? What do you do as a parent trying to protect your kids? Could it be that? It could be. It also could be that somebody got a hold of these kids and they're now using them in the drug trade and the sex trafficking trade, these two girls. That could be the situation too, but nobody seems to care about, about that. And the Lakeville police were doing nothing and maybe there's a fire lit under them now that wasn't lit before. All right, uh, but remember, uh, it's the state that also gets involved in trafficking children. As what's happening in Illinois, uh, when a mother didn't think her son was getting the right di diagnosis and help for his disease, and she went and said, I want to take him to another hospital, and then the hospital stepped in and took the kids away with Illinois court permission and the people live in Missouri. All right, hmm, how does that happen? All right, remember, we're, we're done. If uh, you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's gonna stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless, have a great week. Sets on fire